So uh, welcome everyone. My name is David Owens. I'm the director of the Wondery, a professor of management and innovation. I like the innovation part. It's more important than the management part. Um, and just wanted to uh, welcome you to this event. This is, uh, um, uh, I don't know, I, I saw a preview. I was astounded. I loved the, uh, especially about the film that we're going to see later. Um, so I want to say a couple things. First of all, that this is part of a um, program called Lab to Table uh, that Kendra Oliver, who I'll introduce in a moment, um, created and, and runs. It's really about um, how to think about how scientific research, how science uh, and our communication about science actually affects and impacts and informs society. I think it's a really important thing for us, especially as a university. I think last year we had a billion dollars in federal research money come in to fund scientific research, and the question is, like, you know, to what end? And I think that this uh, uh, panel is going to let us ask some of those kind of questions and maybe get some uh, start on an answer to those. Um, the panel discussion that you're about to see is going to be about the intersection of AI, filmmaking, the art of conveying complex scientific concepts uh, to people. Um, Obviously, AI, AI is a hot topic. Uh, think about the writer strike you know, that just happened. Think about the use of AI in, in movies. Remember uh, Star Wars, little Carrie Fisher, um, and and on on uh, and on from there, and, and even even more so. Uh, I was thinking about ABBA the other day, uh, and the big uh, thing that they did to talk about bringing people uh, back to life. And we'll get to that in the in the film. And so, what's going to be explored is the. Um, I think it's, there's a profound impact that uh, AI is having and can have on cinema, on science communication in in general and how it changes how we think about science, how we engage with science, how we understand science uh, to be. There are going to be questions about, um, about science. How do you make decisions about the role of science? I was talking to a colleague earlier today, and he said, if we can do it, we do it. And I thought, like, that's an interesting uh, uh, idea, that maybe there are ways for us to make better, uh, more informed, or at least you know, more judicious decisions about what we do. And I think the kind of thing that you're going to see today helps us understand ways to understand what the implications are of just doing it and actually thinking uh, it through a little bit more. I think the, um, there's some uh, discussions you know, uh, the undergirding this is about what, like, what is the point of science? Uh, and really the point of science, especially if you're not thinking about humans, if you're not thinking about humanity, if we think about what science is, it is for us as humanists or as humans, and, and it's, we often uh, defer to the humanists to talk about that, but they, they don't have control over the science. So like, how do we bring those things together in an important way? So you're gonna see a short film about, uh, that's created by some Vanderbilt students, the thing that astounded me, I'll say, um, that addresses many of these questions, and there's gonna be a discussion, and the film are gonna represent a cross-disciplinary project. Um, I'm the director of the Wondery, and the Wondery, we are really into cross-disciplinary projects. We're into things where, um, you know, art and science, for example, even though for many of us, they probably just are, it's obvious that they have to be next to each other, uh, makes sense, but that we are actually, um, have to fight to have a place like that uh, on this campus. Um, let's see, I wanna say that this is a, it's, it's impressive, you'll, I'm sure, I know you'll be impressed, and it is something to show, to showcase the, the, both the creative uh, and the entrepreneurial and the sort of the carry through and the high production value, all of those things that our, our students have uh, these days. And so I think that is important to uh, call out. Let me introduce um, in a moment uh, Kendra Oliver. Kendra is, is the ringleader, I guess we would call it here. Uh, she's an experienced scientist. She's passionate about science. I do lots of tours, uh, science, science communication. That's really what, uh, what her area is. She's a pharmacologist, trained uh, research scientist in pharmacology, um, which to me makes sense because she's a visual artist also and sort of thinking about like molecules and how things fit together. Um, um, when we first uh, uh, started spending time together at, at the Wondery, one thing Kendra um, showed me was a, a display of, of uh, paintings and um, photographs and things. And her uh, pitch to me was, hey, uh, Dave, one of the reasons people don't believe science is because they don't understand it. And they don't understand it not because they're dumb, but because of how we communicate it. Like, we're dumb in how we communicate it. And so go look at the, an academic journal and try to understand that versus looking at the paintings. There's a painting that sort of tells me why my eyes are brown because of my DNA and all of those kind of things. And every time 
I have a tour in the Wondery, which is probably like four or five times a week, I point that out to say, look, we, how we communicate science really matters and how we communicate these concepts matter. And we need to let people in so they can help us make decisions about this. They can help us have a judgment about it uh, and, and work in that way. And so Kendra is a science communication designer. She's got skills from project management, most important skill, uh, I would argue, um, and pedagogical approaches to learning, to online learning, to video production, to instructional design, painting, you know, all kinds of uh, Renaissance woman things. And so she is interested in developing and utilizing the skills to produce science uh, communications uh, and science and marketing science in ways that cause it to be or, or will, will help it become more um, acceptable, more uh, uh, engaging, and more um, a topic that we can talk about and give us language and give us images and give us visual things that we can to think about how to talk about science. Kendra, you want to come on up? All right. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Dave, for the introduction. Um, as, as he, my name is Kendra Oliver. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Pharmacology and Basic Sciences. And I've had the incredible opportunity through the School of Medicine Basic Sciences to again explore, and through the you know through the Wandry and through various uh, groups on campus, explore cross-disciplinary projects. And so the one of the results of this is a program called Art Lab, um, which looks at integrating science, art, technology, education to leverage and engage some of the expertise that we have within the, the basic sciences. And so the goal of this program is really to design transformative content experiences, programs that provide human context, as, as Dave had kind of mentioned, and touch points for science and scientists to engage. And so our objective is really to engage people from all backgrounds in meaningful, creative um, work that communicates and transforms uh, science ideas into something that can be ap approached by everybody. And so um, this has led to a number of successful programs. Um, but what you're going to be hearing about today is kind of one of our experiments, right? We're still trying to understand the best way to do this. And I'm very privileged to have had the opportunity to work with um, three really incredible students. Um, it's kind of started with the idea of uh, what is the importance of science conscious filmmaking? And so I met these students actually through the Wandry. Uh, uh, Charleston Bell from the Wandry introduced me uh, to Gus initially uh, because uh, they were driven and thinking already about this very entrepreneurial production company. And um, when they first came to me, I'm like, I don't really do films. You know, I do some website design stuff. But by the time I saw their first two films, I knew that I needed to figure out a way to work with them. It was just so impactful. Um, both Oddsmaker and Breakout Breakup touch on key concepts that I think resonate with a lot of the research that's being done within the basic sciences. Um, I, I mean, things from addiction to anxiety, mental health, gambling, and more. And I'd asked them, had you talked to anybody in the basic sciences about these you know, really key concepts that you guys are, are working on? And they hadn't really talked to any researchers. And that's where I saw the opportunity, basically to you know, let me have the opportunity to work with them. Right. And uh, that became the objective in my mind was uh, to think about art and filmmaking as one of those touch points, one of those ways that we can uh, really showcase the incredible research that's happening within the School of Medicine Basic Sciences. And so with that, I'm going to go ahead and ask the panelists to join us on stage. And I will turn it over to Gus, who will continue with our panel discussion and kind of set up the film that you're about to see. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to Hollywood Reimagined with AI. Um, and thank you for coming out to the screening, the premiere screening of On the Dying Grass. On behalf of me and the other two filmmakers in the room, actually, we have more than two filmmakers in the room. Um, but on the behalf of the other two Vanderbilt students in the room, thank you guys for being here. Um, thank you to the fashion people out front. You guys look amazing. Thank you for making the event feel um, <laughs> feel that fun. Alia, thank you for DJing, as always. Um, I have three amazing Vanderbilt professors here on stage. Um, I'll have them introduce themselves, but these are people thinking at the forefront of what AI is going to do um, to the world, to academia, but to the world, um, from entertainment to um, 
what does an emergent technology mean ethically for all of us? So I'll have them introduce themselves. Hello, I'm Oli Mulvig. Um, I am a humanist who works at the intersection of the sciences, technology, and the humanities. I do so through the departments of history, cinema, communications and science technology, the Wondry, um, where, I teach at the, where I run the Emergent Technology Lab, and run a number of courses on topics like AI and society. So this could not have been a better fit, uh, thinking about how this movie thinks, um, displays, communicates, and I've had hours of wonderful conversations with Gus and his colleagues on these very topics. I'm David Thorstad. I'm a faculty member in the philosophy department here. I think a lot about normative issues raised by artificial intelligence, some of the new opportunities we can bring actors alive, and also some of the challenges, bias, transparency, explanation. And I think about bounded rationality, so what it means to be limited in the way that humans are, and I think about whether or not machines are limited or maybe less limited in some of these ways. Hi, my name is Claire Cisco King. I'm an associate professor in communication studies, and I'm chair of the cinema and media arts department. I am a critical cultural scholar of uh, cinema, media, and visual culture, and my most recent book is on celebrity culture. So uh, I am particularly interested in that part of the film that we're going to get to watch together. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Um, so we're going to have this panel basically as a, uh, a lens to look at um, AI and the entertainment industry, and, um, and entertainment in general, but a lens to this film called On the Dying Grass. Um, On the Dying Grass is about a lot of things. It's about, like, at a very surface level, um, what is it going to look like when Hollywood, I mean, they already are, but when Hollywood is able to bring back actors who are no longer here anymore? Like, what are the um, ethical implications when you can see a movie and Marilyn Monroe is back on screen? What does that mean for the entertainment industry? What does that mean for us? It's about human connection, too. Like, when a son loses a father, what does it mean to have the father back in that way? Um, it's about regulation. It's about responsibility. Um, it's about a lot of things. But I just read a, um, an article from The Economist last night. Dad, thank you for the login um, information. <laughs> um, it, was, it was awesome. It was, like, right on, it was right on the nose what this film is about. It's how is the entertainment industry going to change? How is fame going to change with AI? Um, they brought up two examples, which I love, and um, uh, Mr. Owens also brought up. But Disney just, uh, in the long line of bringing back Star Wars actors, they just also bought um, the rights to, or reserved the rights to, Dave, um, to uh, Darth Vader's voice. So now uh, he can continue to scare children for um, years to come. So any movie after this, when you hear James Earl Jones' joy voice, the, it They've reserved the right to it. Um, and then they also brought up this example of uh, ABBA in uh, London. Um, ABBA is on the couch just chilling out while their holograms, um, like them and their prime, are performing on stage to almost a sold out audience in uh, London every night. Um, so just thinking about those examples, thinking about what you guys are already thinking about, um, how do you think that AI has the opportunity to change the entertainment industry, um, the future of it? And then what are sort of the ethical implications of that change? I'll go ahead and take a uh, jump at this one. I think it's actually a great question for this panel. It's got an element of celebrity, an element of ethics, um, and, and an element of application. And I'm going to address that, um, that aspect of ap application. It, we're at this moment of um, uncertainty kind of around where AI can go, where it has been, and where it should go. And I think these questions kind of help us frame that. And one of the, the possibilities we have is a tool of d democratization of these techniques, right? Something that I cannot do by myself. I can use AI tools to do much better than I could do without. And that feels like it's going to open up possibilities for new voices, new experiences, new actors. Um, at the same time, like with most technologies, it has the opportunity to really kind of crystallize around those who are already famous or, or well-known. So why would you hire me as a voice actor when you could have James Earl Jones as a voice actor for that very same um, experience? One of those is much better recognized um, and, 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 and powerful. And therefore, we're going to find a closing or a limiting of the number of opportunities that become 
available for non-recognized actors. If you're now competing against everybody else who's alive and also those who already have this reputation. So at the same time, that same technology can be both an expanding and a contracting opportunity for those who are trying to make it in this industry. Um, and it makes me think a lot about one of the questions in my own work that I spend with AI and deep fakes is around these questions of authenticity. Kind of when do digital replicas feel authentic and when do they not feel authentic and how do you kind of maximize that use case? Like if I were sitting in this room and James Earl Jones was here and we had a one-on-one -on -one conversation, that would be an extraordinarily authentic and awesome <laughs> event for me to have. Um, were I to have a phone call with him, that's, that's a little less um, meaningful and authentic but still Pretty much, pretty much so. If I watch him in a movie, do I really care if it's him behind the microphone versus an AI behind the microphone? I'm not sure. And that the kind of as that moves from one media to another, I really think we need to think pretty critically about where is the value in that authentic interaction, and where does it was its replicability or longevity become what we want to focus on. Picking up, I think, on one of the threads from Oli's remarks, there's been some thinking about the future of labor in an AI-driven marketplace. And it's important, I think, to remember what we see on the screen and what we don't see. So what we do see on the screen is a very famous actor and the legacy of this actor. But what we don't see is also going to be ethically up for contestation. So we have discussions about animators, discussions about extras, discussions about supporting actors. And one of the, I think, most immediately um, salient ethical issues in the industry for many people is what's going to happen to the broader labor force in the industry. So I think it, it's very important to focus on celebrity and the role of celebrity in labor, but it's also important to keep sight of a large industry and the future of labor in that industry. So much of this conversation is focused on, the larger conversation about AI is focused on the novelty, the uncertainty, and the sort of the now and the future. Uh, but I also want to think about these questions in terms of history, in particular history of the cinema, history of celebrity. Um, when we think about what celebrity and the cinema have been imagined as doing, um, it's often tasked with a kind of preservationist impulse, right? So um, when we when people talk about what makes camera-based images unique, whether that's photography, cinema, um, they often refer to a quality of indexicality, the idea that the camera captures something that was there, right? That it can point to a thing that was present and, and happened. And given that largely imagined capacity of the camera, uh, or at least fantasized capacity of the camera, uh, images have been tasked with preserving what was. Uh, this is what Andre Bazan refers to as one of the kind of ontologies of uh, the photographic image, that it captures life, that it preserves it, and that it does so in the context of, of human um, mortality, right? We know that we are finite beings, and so the idea that images can live on past us is an incredibly romantic and seductive idea. And we often put images to that task. Celebrity culture plays that out in a kind of hyperbolic way. If celebrities function as these kind of um, fantastic projections of who we had imagined ourselves to be, their images can can live on um, in a way that, um, that we can identify with, right, and, and aspire to live on. Uh, we've seen examples of um, um, that kind of hope uh, when we see the loss of a celebrity, right? Someone like Matthew Perry who recently passed or someone like Philip Seymour Hoffman whose passing left such a hole in our, in our cultural imaginary. Um, and so in some ways it's interesting to think about how AI is not uh, offering a new way of thinking about film and celebrity but is animating tendencies that have been there since the inception of the medium and since the inception of the star system. And as you'll see in the, in the film today, it is so much about um, how AI can take up these preservationist impulses, but one of the, the ethical and technological, and I think also sort of labor questions, relates to that notion of indexicality, right? That, that AI puts some erasure around the concept of the index, because now uh, we there are questions around what was there before. Uh, the AI can generate newness out of data that it aggregates from you know hours and hours and years and years of images and footage, but then it's generating something that's not necessarily tied to that historical past. And so I think that we're really today being asked to think about questions of, of historicity as well as these important questions about futurity that always get raised around AI. I really liked Professor Thorsted bringing up like the other side of the enter entertainment industry's labor market. Like we're thinking this film is very much about a very famous celebrity, like Elijah Evans, a Harrison Ford like figure, like 
imagine if Harrison Ford died four years from now, what we as like an audience would want or feel about Harrison Ford passing. Um, but there is, on the flip side of that, the entire like apparatus beside behind the entertainment industry, the actors who want to be Harrison Ford one day, um, the the production crews behind all of these things that may or may not um, be having jobs that were previously there before. Um, one of the funny things that the economist brought up um, was that the strikes that had just ended, um, very much so some of the bigger name Hollywood actors were also freaking out about AI. They were like, this could replace me in a lot of ways. Um, well, the economists argued that they shouldn't be the ones freaking out. Like, if you think about AI and who might benefit the most from this in the entertainment industry, it's the Taylor Swifts of the world. And and why is because the only reason Taylor Swift may not be um, may not be making as much money as she possibly could, and she's making a lot of money, <laughs> but it's because she's not able to be present in every arena in the world at once. Um, and ABBA shows if you have the technology to be able to do that, Taylor Swift may feasibly be able to be on every screen every theater, every arena in the world at once. Um, Leonardo DiCaprio could be in feasibly five movies a year if it's an AI version of Leonardo DiCaprio. Mara Monroe might be there in seven, um, seven, eight, 20, and she's no longer there anymore. Um, so it's this, also this question bringing up of, entertainment is a winner takes all economy when it comes to actors. Does AI exacerbate the winner takes all nature of it? Like do you, does it, does it just make this feedback loop where I don't want a new star anymore because Taylor Swift is still there and Marilyn Monroe has always been there and those are the people that I want to be on screen? Or do you think that everyone in entertainment is already sick that Marvel's made their 30th, 33rd movie and Indiana Jones really, really tanked and maybe I don't want to see Harrison Ford anymore? Like, I'm, I'm curious to, f to feel when Harrison Ford dies. Do, does the audience want him back? Like, the studios will respond, but like, what is your guys' impression of, is it a case-by-case -case basis? Like, do we want those stars to live on forever? Or is there something human in us where we're like, we're okay with letting them die? Are you okay yes. letting Harrison Ford die? Only? <laughs> <laughs> Poor Harrison. Um, I don't know how to answer the we in that, <laughs> the we, yeah. in, in that question. Um, I, clearly, there's going to be uh, communities that will definitively answer no, we're done, and others that will be incredibly enthusiastic. The scale of those communities will be the, the, the market choices that um, need to get made. Um, I expect there will be oversaturation. I mean, AI is one opportunity for AI is to lead to oversaturation pretty quickly, and we'll need to figure out what we deal with that. And we've done that before. I mean, there's certainly been, from going from print to, to movies to, to television and radio and so forth, we've had these moments where new technologies allow for an amplification at a different scale and a different cost structure and so forth. And, and I, I expect we'll, this will average out to something along those lines. But that question about do we want to have a winner-take-all economy, that every, so much suggests that's where we'll end up regardless if we want that to be the, the, the case. But this is a novel enough area that there could be choices that are made if that is the kind of the general consensus that we don't want to exacerbate that further, that we want to lean into these as new tools that allow new types of creators to make a broader variety of, of options. Um, on the other hand, market dynamics have often led to consolidation and, um, and a kind of winner-takes-all mentality. But there are definitely examples in some industries where it's much more exasperated around a few winners and a whole lot of um, losers um, in other areas where there's a much broader spectrum. And I, I personally would prefer that latter one, but I, I don't know um, if, uh, how many people agree with that. I mean, the, the market suggests that we really like celebrities. <laughs> One of the most enduring philosophical questions in this age is about the question of personal identity. And historically, this was just a simple question. What makes me the same person I was last year and not my twin brother right now? But the possibility of AI technologies producing increasingly good, at least, simulations of persons brings another ethical dimension to this. Of course, eventually, not in this movie, but eventually we'll be asking is this dead actor appearing on the stage literally the same person as the person I knew and loved? But even before the question of identity comes up, we have questions of survival. Is there a way in which the actor can survive on? And is there a way in which my relationships as a family member or as a fan with the actor 
survive on. I, I, one of the most interesting aspects, I think, of this film is you'll see a split between different characters in their relationship with the actor. You'll see some family members who think that it's actually possible to have an ongoing, meaningful relationship continue with this person on the screen. And you'll see some other people very much disposed to let that relationship end and die. So I'm really interested in the contestation of what counts as an identity relationship or a survival or a, a continuation of even something as commercial as, as being a fan and wanting to see someone's movie anymore. I think one of the things I really like about this film is that it's interested uh, in questions of the relationship between old and new media. So you'll see moments of, of reference to old media, uh, VHS, for instance. Um, and this, this makes me think about the ongoing dialogues about newness and how it affects industries. And the film industry has long been defined by these moments of, of panic um, and you know pro protestations and declarations of its own doom really since the beginning of the industry, right? So for instance, since the development of synchronized sound in the late 1920s, early 1930s was declared by many filmmakers and, and studio executives to be the end of the cinema because it changed how cameras were used uh, in, in order to account for um, the production of sound and recording of sound. Um, the advent of television right, was, was described as a death knell for the cinema because people were going to not ever leave their homes again to go to the big screen and instead were going to you know, stay in the comfort of their living room to watch television. Of course, the advent of, of the internet. right? We, we have these same sort of discourses about what will happen to the industry. And I think what we see again and again is that um, the hegemony uh, of an industry like um like the film industry in the United States in particular, finds a way to adapt and to appropriate and, and to make use of. And so, I mean, I think to, to Oli's point um, that we'll see the capacity for both the, the re-amplification and the perpetuation of these hierarchies, um, but I think we'll also see opportunities for resistance, right? The same thing is true of, of the internet. Uh, the technology itself does not have um, a kind of morality. It has to do with its application and its use. And so we will see opportunities for exploitation that will continue to exacerbate conditions of inequity um, in the industry, and we will see opportunities for people to speak back to and, and to counter um, those. And so I think our responsibility as the producers, consumers, scholars of, of media is, is to, to speak out and to read closely what we see in those instances, right, to call out those abuses of power and to amplify the moments that can be, uh, that can be points of rupture or resistance. Thank you guys for that conversation. Um, thank you for helping orient the audience to the film we're about to see. Thank you, Mr. Owens and Kendra, for the lovely introduction. Um, and without further ado, we will now watch this film. 